Ka tangi te titi, ka tangi te kaka, ka tangi hoki a hau, uh, tēnā te he Māori ora, e nā mana, e nā reo, e rā raka te rama, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā koutou katoa. She's just admiring the beautiful hat in the audience tonight. Uh, and uh, welcome, welcome, thrice welcome. Um, uh, ki te rangatira, uh, tēnā koutou, uh, ki nē um, uh, mana hira, uh, te o, f, o hōwei whā, uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, tēnē tu raru i te maru uh, o nga mana whenua, uh, nga te māmoi, uh, kai, um, waitaha kaitahu, uh, nau mai harau mai tauti mai. Uh, ki te whare, uh, tū nei, um, tēnā koe, uh, tū tanu, uh, tū tanu, e ne mate hairi, hairi hoki atu rā ki te pō. Uh, ko Waiau, ko Richard Blakey Taka Wingua, he kaimahi aha o te whare wananga o tākau, a uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, kia ora and welcome everyone to this um, wonderful occasion to celebrate academic success at the University of Otago through an inaugural professorial lecture where, uh, Alex, we are we're looking forward to hearing from you and, and celebrating with you. Um, we uh, acknowledge uh, your uh, excellence uh, in this uh, achieving this uh, outstanding promotion. We also welcome members of the academic community of Otago, uh, academic staff, students, colleagues, members of the public of Otapoti Dunedin, and also, uh, especially to people online, uh, members and of the wider general public, friends and supporters of Alex. Uh, from all around the world. Um, we have special guests within the audience here, uh, your wife Kath, uh, uh, Raymond uh, and Rachel, uh, your grandkids Connor and Paige I want to acknowledge. Um, and I know online um, there are people such as um, Hannah and Toby watching from California. I understand that uh, things might be quite uh, challenging with you so our hearts go out to you. We've had our challenges here in Otapoti with, with rain and it's just so unfortunate that we can't easily take our abundance and help you with your, with your issues but we wish you all the best for the challenges that, that lie ahead. And to, to others uh, near and far, welcome, welcome and thrice welcome again. Um, my role is uh, a little bit MC and over overview. I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research and Enterprise at the University and am here representing the Vice-Chancellor tonight. Just to give you a little bit of a, a, of a landscape map before I introduce Associate Professor Vivian Anderson to, to introduce Alex's talk. <coughs> We really want to uh, celebrate success and academic success here at the University of Otago and in career progression and promotion, being promoted to the level of professor here at the University of Otago is a pinnacle achievement. It is a, a difficult uh, achievement because our academic roles require balance between teaching, research and service and achieving what we call sustained outstanding lead leadership and competence in at least two of those three areas is the minimum requirement for promotion to professor. And I, I, I can't understate the, the level of outstanding leadership and competence that's required. We use international referees to assess performance against uh, global standards and um, we'll often say that uh, a dedicated career academic could devote full time to achieving uh, outstanding leadership and competence in only one of those, but we have three categories and I believe that uh, SOLC was uh, achieved in all three of those categories for Alex. Um, working in uh, a professional context, early childhood education and teacher education, <coughs> provides an opportunity for research to inform that teaching context, but also for the professional practice of teaching to inform research and, and our university colleagues. And <coughs> your performance and your role has exemplified what we expect out of an outstanding academic here at Otago. You have um, impact through your research and engagement with the profession. You're a popular and sought after supervisor in multiple programs, Master of Teaching and Learning, a PhD, and I would like to stress our professional doctorate, the educational doctorate. Uh, you're an effective and successful teacher from the 100 level all the way to the 900 level and engage in your professional activities, your teaching and research with professional bodies, policy and practice through the Teaching Council, Ministry of Education, Advice 
uh, ERO and the, the um, university CUAP. Uh, so um, it, it, it's, it's just my privilege to be here to be able to uh, share with you at, at this occasion tonight, Alex. And uh, in reading your resume, I also found that we are in some ways twins because your academic journey uh, matches mine and starting from the mid-90s at the University of Canterbury. Uh, finding that uh, 2011 is a good year to reassess uh, one's position uh, in the shaky place, uh, coming to Otago in that year, as I did, and then establish, establishing yourself successfully here at the University of Otago, where we are both uh, very proud of uh, having been academics at the University of Canterbury, and we come here as ambassadors of Te Waiponamu and the wider uh, tertiary sector here. So please, on behalf of the University of Otago, accept our congratulations on this uh, well-deserved promotion, and I'll now hand over to Associate Professor Vivian Anderson to give a more detailed introduction. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa. Ko te mea tō tahi, uh, ka maumahara ahau a uh, Jenny Galitli. Uh, he hoa mahi ki te whānau o te kura a koutai toka. Moi mai rā, moi mai rā, moi mai rā e hoa o ki o ki ai. Tātou te hoka mate ki te hoka mate, tātou te hoka ora ki te hoka ora. E mihi ana ahau ki, ki ka mana, mana whenua, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia koutou, ka whānau, ka hoa, ka hoa mahi o Professor Alex Gunn, tēnā koutou katoa. No mai tau tī mai ki tēnei hui whakahira ai ki a ia, tēnā koutou. Ko wai au, ko auraki te mauka whakaruru hau ki a hau. Ko wai makariri te awa whakaruru hau ki a hau. No ikarangi me kotirana o hoku tipuna, e kari no o tautahi a hau. Ko Vivian Anderson, tō hoku e kua, a ko au te manutaki kei te kura, a koutai tōka. Kia ora tātou. So, kia ora koutou, welcome to you all, family members, friends, colleagues of Alex, Professor Alex Gunn. Um, it's really exciting to be here tonight and um, to celebrate with her, her promotion to Professor. So, it's my privilege to introduce Alex and to provide a very brief introduction to her lecture, and I'm not going to steal her thunder. So Alex's professional story begins here in Ōtepoti before 2011. So she graduated with a diploma in early childhood education from the then Dunedin Teachers College and a Bachelor of Education from the University of Otago in 1991. Her professional career in early childhood education began at the Otago University Nursery Association. But then her educational story takes us on a journey up the motu. Um, she was awarded a postgraduate diploma in arts from the University of Otago in 1993, a Master of Arts from the University of Canterbury in 1998, and a Doctor of Education from the University of Waikato in 2009. So Professor Gunn has worked in initial teacher education since 1996, which is a really impressive record initially at the Christchurch College of Education, as uh, Richard noted, and then in 2011 she returned here to take up a lecturing role at Te Kura Akotai Toka, the University of Otago College of Education. So um, Professor Blakey has already noted that a professorial promotion rests on demonstrated strength in teaching research and service, and Professor Gunn has excelled in all three areas. She's a very valued and skilled contributor to our initial teacher education, education studies and postgraduate studies programs. She's supervised numerous postgraduate and doctoral students, and she's developed an extensive research record. Professor Gunn has been involved in a wide range of research collaborations, and since 2011 she's led or co-led three teaching and learning research initiative grant funded projects and these are really special um, externally funded projects funded by the Ministry of Education and aimed at informing education practice through research partnerships with practitioners. Professor Gunn has an incredibly impressive record of educational leadership, both locally and nationally. From 2014 to 2020, she served as our Associate Dean Teacher Education 
And during that time, she led the college through three initial teacher education program reviews, and that's an enormous undertaking. In 2020 to 2021, she led a complete redesign of our initial teacher education conceptual framework to place te tiriti based relationships at the heart of what we do, um, to foreground place or whenua in relation to our work, and to place te ao Māori at the heart of our teacher education programs. And we're still growing into living that conceptual framework. Professor Gunn has led the profession nationally as an elected member and chair of the Teacher Education Forum of Aotearoa New Zealand, or TEFANS Council, an editorial board member and chair for the New Zealand Journal of Educational Studies, and convener of the New Zealand Council of Deans of Education Early Childhood Education Advisory. You can see why I need notes. In 2021, she was appointed to the Ministry of Education Curriculum Advisory Group, and this is a ministerial group which takes her outside early, edu early childhood education, and it is advising the national work on the NZC, or New Zealand Curriculum Refresh. Professor Gunn's contribution to education in Aotearoa Me Te Waipaunamu was honoured last year when she was made an Honourable Fellow of the New Zealand Educational Institute, and last week when she was awarded the Teacher Education Forum of Aotearoa New Zealand Sustained Excellence in Teacher Education Award. Congratulations, Alex. Professor Gunn will tell you about her research, but just by way of a very brief introduction, her work reflects a fascination with how teachers' beliefs and values inform their practices and the ways institutionalised discourses shape thinking and practice. Her lecture this evening reflects her commitment to early childhood education and to themes of equity and empowerment as foundational motivations for early childhood teachers' work. She will highlight the powerful role of kayako in supporting Fano to recognise the uniqueness of tamariki as learners and as people who make meaningful connections with and contributions to the world. In tonight's lecture, Professor Gunn will draw on the Early Childhood Curriculum Framework Te Whariki and her research to illustrate how intentional teaching by qualified and sensitive kaiako in the early years warrants our utmost regard and attention. I think this is only the second IPL at Otago for an Early Childhood Education Scholar, so this is a really auspicious occasion, just want to acknowledge that. Um, so Alex, we're really thrilled to celebrate with you your important and fantastic mahi over many years, um, the impact that's had on Kayako nationally and the education community more broadly, and to celebrate with you this well-deserved promotion, and we look forward to hearing what you have to share with us this evening. Ho mai te paki paki mō Professor Alex Gunn. <laughs> Karoko aki au, ki te tangi a te manu nei, ko te manu tui, tui tui, tui tui a, tui a i roka, tui a i raro, tui a i roto, tui a i waho, ti hei mauri ora. Ko auraki, te mauka i a huri nei taku ngākau. Ko whanganui i a tāra, tōku tino moana, nō kotirana o ku tipuna. I tai mai tōku mātua ki Aotearoa i te waikanui o te rā rautau. Ko gan tōku iwi ko te rana. Nō pareroa ahau, kei kōpitai tōku kaika nāi nei, ko Alex ahau. Tira pia ko mōhio ki e koutou. <laughs> Tuatahi. Ka mihi au ki ka mana whenua me ka tōhu o te rohi nei. Ko ka hau kaika ki o tākau, ki pukitiraki, ki moiraki anō hoki. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Tō roa. Ka mihi koutou e te uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellor Richard, e te Pro Vice-Chancellor Jess, e te Dean Viv, Mihi mahana ki a koutou. 
Ka mahi ki ka raira ka tira mā, ka hoa mahi ki konei kai wai hopai hoki, me ka tauira, me ka manuhiri o te whariwana ka oa o tākau. Malo i le lei, talo falava, talo ha ni ki o rana, whaka la ofa lahi atu, namaste, ni sa bola ala sa malaikam, Tēnā koutou katoa. Ki taku whānau, whānui, ki konei me mai te, uh, me mai te mata ipurangi, ipurangi hoki, no mai hoki mai. Ki ka hoa mā e kiti ana mai te mata ipurangi, no mai, haere mai, mihi mai, mihi mai ki a koutou katoa i tēnei pō. Nō no reira, tēnā koutou katoa. So, in a typically discourse analyst manner, I'd like to begin this evening by addressing the title of my talk tonight, Learning Right from the Start, right as in well or good or proper, while also learning right from the start, wherever you think that start might be and whomever you think is doing the learning. I'm starting here because I really do definitely want to leave you all with the impression that there is a character or a quality to the work of teaching and researching in this field of early childhood education that can be recognised as consistent with particular expressed values, expectations and aspirations for tamariki mokopuna and their whanau in this country. And I want to say that we really must pay attention to this if the policy, structural and practical conditions uh, uh, that we really must pay attention to this and that the policy, structural and practical conditions of this teacher's work need to be commensurate with those values, practices uh, and expectations, all told. If we are to do good by folk in this sector of education, in early childhood education and thereby good by the country overall, we have to pay attention to the concepts in the second part of my title here about empowerment and equity in early childhood education. I'm hoping already that you can tell that issues of power and the self and the entanglements of these by kaya kōminga tamariki in the early childhood years will start to form the threads of my talk tonight. And so as a typical teacher, I want to give you a little bit of an overview of what's coming in the next 40 minutes or so. This lecture addresses themes of equity and empowerment as foundational motivations for the work of the early childhood kaiako. In doing so, it aims to convey the powerful role in the kayak, of the kaiako in supporting tamariki, mokopuna and Fano to recognise the tamaiti in their uniqueness as a successful learner and in the ways that they make meaningful connections and contributions in the world. Rooted in the internationally renowned and indigenous early childhood curriculum framework of Te Whariki, the introduction of which and implementation of which has coincided entirely with my career, I will share research data tonight at examples of studies that I've been involved with that illustrate how intentional teaching by qualified and sensitive kaiako in the early years warrants our utmost attention and regard. I want to illustrate one, that one of the most powerful the te I want to illustrate one of the most powerful tools a teacher has, and with which they can open up the eyes of everybody else to the uniqueness of the child. So in time, I will come to a discussion about assessment practice in the early years and how through the power of the pen, or in other words, through teacher voice, kayako may author and authorise children as subjects of a particular kind. Strong learners with mana who, when they stand strong in their language, culture and identity, may take their early childhood experiences into kura, into school, into life, and thrive. What I want to talk about tonight is the idea that kaiako, especially in the early years, 
hold immense power, power to shape people's identities in particular ways, be those people tamariki mokopuna, be they parents, me whānau whānui katoa, be they themselves, be they other kaiako, be they student teachers. And that to wield this power well, it takes critical thinking, sensitivity, a social conscience, an awareness, empathy, the capacity to write, the capacity to think, to analyse, to predict. These are capabilities honed through study in teacher education and through varied life experiences over time. And these kaiko have a particular role to play in shaping learner and parent identities, including helping Fano understand what it might mean to partner with others over the long learning journeys of their tamariki. So that when those children head off into school or kura, families go into those spaces too, expecting to stay in conversation with their child's teachers about learning and teaching over the long term. I want to comment on the fact that teaching and learning is tough, it's risky, it's demanding work, because at the fundamental level, learning represents change, and oftentimes we resist that. But even though teaching and learning is tough and risky and demanding, it is also full of life, love, caring, risk-taking, grit, and an adherence to a longer-term view in an ever-changing world. Because when you teach, especially in the early years, the time we have is fleeting. But our effect can be lasting as tamariki mokapuna move increasingly on and out and into the world. So how come I know about this? What is it that gives me license to claim such truths of teaching, of learning and early childhood education well, Richard and Viv have given you a bit of an insight already. But I hope to trace a little bit of a journey next that will tie, some, tie together some of my own learning, teaching and research experiences to help explain. And I want to start here. To say first off that timing is everything. And in a profession where most of our teaching happens as we do life with children, when we are interacting over ideas that matter to the child and matter to the community, and when we provide timely feedback through an appropriately timed comment, a question, a remark, a wink, a smile, a nod of the head, a raised eyebrow. <laughs> You're always on as a teacher. You are always seeking for the child to understand that at that very moment, they're on track or not, they're moving in the direction of travel that they intended, or maybe not, that they should keep going with their current strategy, or maybe try something different. The timeliness of the teacher's response is critical if it is to support the person to continue in pursuit of their goals. But also timing in the broader and longer term sense matters as well. Where and when you teach. The policy of the time who's important to you and why. I learned about this in theoretical terms when I was here as an undergraduate student at Otago in the 1980s. I was introduced to the thinking of early Bronfenbrenner. This is a name that many of you may know. Bronfenbrenner posited a theory of human development and learning that recognised how one's life experiences and trajectories were greatly influenced by not only your direct experiences, the things that happen to you in your home, your school or your local life, but also by the relationships between those significant sites of living, your home, your school, your marae, your church, so on and so forth. The broader cultural context of where you lived matters and the time period of that existence. I think of those pepe born since 2020, 2021, whose lives have always known Mate Corona. I think of my niece and her family in Otautahi, who moved into our own broken house there 
when after 40 seconds of extreme earth shaking one Saturday morning in 2010, they lost a home, a church, a school and a neighbourhood. The experiences of those children have been uniquely formed in ways previously unimaginable to us as a direct consequence of where they were born, when they were born and what happened locally and globally thereafter. So in the context of my life as an education academic and an early childhood kayakal, timing has been everything too. I've had the absolute privilege of being in this field in Aotearoa at the right time in the right place with the people who needed to be right there along the way. At the start, the community of scholars in Kayakul who helped orient me towards the social justice, inclusive education and child's rights basis of early childhood included people from the former College of Education, Barbara McKay, Marg Whitford, Alice Turnbull, Lynn Foote and others. Here at the university, the lineup was equally as impressive. Anne Smith, Keith Ballard, Terry Crooks, Ted Glynn, Russell Bishop, Toroa and Godfrey Pohatu, and more. But as well as those people, the broader context of my work has been just as important. My time in early childhood education has coincided with a massive expansion of the field internationally as well as here at home. Also the emergence of early childhood curricula of all sorts around the world, led significantly by our own curriculum framework, Te Whariki, which has occupied a great deal of my interest in activism. My entry into the field occurred concurrent with qualification parity for early childhood education. That milestone paved the way for the then Dunedin College to be one of only two providers of a new three-year teacher education qualification for ECE. And I managed to get a seat in that class. I say managed, it was never gonna be a sure thing. I'd had a fairly checkered educational experience. Over time, I've found that many teachers have. <laughs> I didn't get UE but I had had quite a lot of diverse life experiences and I could talk pretty well, especially in interview. I got discretionary entrance to university and to the college and thankfully managed to pass that first year. So I stayed. And I became one of several first degree and diploma holders entering the field at that time. Becoming teacher, this was significant in the field. It rooted us in a profession and in a professional body. For sure, this wasn't a status that everybody wanted. Some still don't. But being teacher could hold us accountable ethically and professionally to standards within the profession which aim to uplift the system and promote trust in its work. Another way that trust was being actively built in the field at that time was through an emerging local early childhood research community, local as in New Zealand based. You don't need to read all that on the screen. I'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> and this was happening through a uniquely interdisciplinary and child rights oriented approach to research that has flourished in this institution through the work of people like Anne Smith and her colleagues at the Children's Issues Centre. Being educated here myself <clears throat> meant that my first research project as an undergraduate student was always going to privilege children's voice in some way. And I went on to explore a question about children's elaborate language and storytelling situations. Now, as a soon-to-be teacher, I was all over the arts and arts education, and storytelling was central to this. For me, storytelling was about kotahitanga, collectivism, learning to listen to others, having your suggestions heard. These were capabilities that were being developed, that were being developed in me by people around me, here at the university, in the teacher unions that I was part of. And these were things that I wanted for others. I had learned that if a teacher could arrange experiences and people and things in a tight, loose kind of way, like a storytelling circle, 
that the rules of engagement in that space could support children who might otherwise not to speak, to listen, to laugh, and to recognise themselves and each other as worthy of being heard. And even for those who contributed by way of listening and watching only, they were seeing what it meant to be heard and to be respected as a person who, even if really fleetingly, was empowered to hold the floor. My project was about children's oral language and storytelling. Was it different to when children just spoke to you, you know, um, in, in, in casually? How and why might that matter? Well, I found out, of course, as you do, uh, when you first in research, you found the truth of these things. It was different. I thought that was good. I didn't really know why that was good, except that at that time, I probably equated good with progress and progress with more. And when children were storytelling, they used more words. If they spoke for more time, they spoke more of a narrative structure. And progress of this kind is what we were after. This is a belief that I'm not so sure of anymore. But I was really hooked by the potential of research and research design. And so that scholarly trajectory got set. Later I was to come back to that theme of storytelling. And let's be honest, what do you do as an academic? You stand up the front, you tell stories about life and love. So storytelling has been and will remain a, a, a key part of what I'm doing through life. But I came back to the theme of storytelling in one of those TLRIs that Viv mentioned when I studied with Mandy Bateman, Margaret Carr, Elaine Rees, and we explored how Kayako in the early years at kindergarten and at school worked to support children's narrative capabilities. Now the importance of oral language and of narrative has become much more evident in recent studies of children's reading. Work by Elaine and Libby and their colleagues has connected vocabulary and reading, oral narrative with reading comprehension. And I became really fascinated by the complexity of children's thinking, of their storying, of their play, and in how Kayako could deliberately support this through the planning of learning environments characterised by free play. So I'd like to share a little bit of data from the TLRI to illustrate this. The participant you're going to hear from is Jacob. He called himself Jacob in the context of our research, and I recorded data with Jacob at kindergarten one afternoon. He and some friends were playing in the sandpit. Teachers were working freely in and around with all children. Jacob was leading the production of multiple storylines over a period of about 30 minutes or so before he looked over to me, took off his microphone. I'd been on the other side of the playground videoing the action. Held his microphone up, indicating to me that for him, data gathering was done for the moment. I'd recorded Jacob's story making across three discrete narratives which came to intersect in really interesting ways. Firstly, Jacob was owner of Dog, and Dog needed to be instructed to do specific things as he learned how to be Dog properly. Second, Jacob was car truck driver and crasher, uh, crashing over ramps and through troughs all over the sandpit. And thirdly, Jacob became burglary instigator as a robber narrative took, uh, took shape within a family story about mums, dads, kids and cars, which also inv uh, involved a visitation by dog and a renegotiation over car ramps between other story partners. Here's a bit of data from this last story that shows how the storylines came to intersect. Um, and what was happening here was Jacob and Mitch had been um, who identified as uh, boys, had been playing with toy cars. Two other cisgender boys, Rory and Kurt, they came over to ask to join them. They were told, no, you can't play with us. Oh, well. Uh, Mitch and Rory, um, with two of the cars, were driving round. Jacob was doing his own um, driving. Kurt stayed sitting on the edge of the sandpit watching because he'd been told he couldn't play. Um, and then Rory um, and Mitch and Kurt and Jacob all kind of converged at the end of the sand, at the edge of the sandpit. And this is what happened. Here comes the rover! Oh no, you didn't mean a kid! Me? No, Regan. Yeah. 
Are you going to do on the baby kid? Yeah. And now I'm the dead. Who's going to be the mom? Break, um, car cane. What? Car cane. Who's the mom? No, I'm not playing. Oh, there's not mom in this game. Yes, there is. No. Mom's and dead. See? But why mom's and dead and kids? Cut. Me I'm really too tired. Go to bed and cut the bed over there. There's a jump over there. No, so it's bed. I love this piece of data for so many reasons. <clears throat> From it, I can comment on the teacher's work, even though they're not directly there in the play. But they had a hand in designing the day in terms of time for children to develop long play scripts. They had a hand in deciding what kind of resources would be available to children to play with. These were deliberate decisions made by the teachers that had direct consequences for curriculum and learning. I can talk about Jacob's bringing together of these three discrete kind of narratives across a whole range of different people, his ability to sustain and complexify the storying. The ideas that the group bring to the broader robber family narrative. And of course, Kurt's position in this part of the story at the end here, where occupying the role of mum is not a possibility for him, but a family setting where two dads is offered up instead. Now I'm really interested in this last bit of mums, dads, kids and cars. It reflects a second major trajectory within the research that I've worked in over my career. And this is a line of work concerned with curriculum that has at its centre concerns for social justice, equity and inclusive education. My work has particularly concerned social justice in terms of sexualities, matters, gender, and how in early childhood education we might facilitate inclusion, diversity and equity in these domains. Here, I have four iterations of our early childhood curriculum framework, Te Whareke. Now recall my point from earlier, when I said about the importance of the ecosystem of a teacher's work. Well, I was a beginning teacher when Te Whareke was first in development there, uh, right on the edge of the screen. And then um, I was leading a team of kayako when in 1993 the second version of the framework was formally trialled in the field. Now the service I was working in was part of the nationwide evaluation of the early implementation of Te Whareke. And in 1995, when that work was in full swing, I was fortunate enough to be sent as a union delegate to the sixth early childhood convention in Tamaki Makoto with longtime friends and collaborators Claire Wells and Linda Mitchell. In a plenary session to that conference, I sat listening to Tilly Te Koingo, now Lady Reedy, and she described Te Whareke, its basis, its aspirations, the weddle it set for the profession that I was finding my feet within. I heard her say, Te Whareke is about empowering the children to learn. Ko te whakamana e te mokupuna ki te ako. And this is a message that she and many others have repeated at every opportunity since. This empowerment, manifest in the concept of mana, is what really described as the principal outcome of Te Whareke. The child is nurtured in the knowledge that they are loved and respected, that their physical, mental, spiritual and emotional strength will build influence and control, that having mana is the enabling and empowering tool to controlling their own destiny. I really do remember thinking then, huh, is this what I signed up for? And then I thought, huh, this is what I signed up for. And so, once the 1996 version of that curriculum framework was published, I was well and truly sold 
on the potential of this tool as a means of coordinating early childhood practice with children and whānau across the motu. Next, my research interests really centred, started to centre around social justice and equity, and in particular on the issue of heteronormativity. Heteronormativity, if it's a word you've never heard of, is about the idea that heterosexual sexuality is um, upheld as a normative standard, that it gets imposed on people. Um, and this happens through straight curriculum in our early childhood settings. Now my kids, they were being raised in a lesbian-led household. Their lives as such, and those of their friends who were similarly located, were completely absent and talk about representations of and conceptions of family reflected in early childhood teaching practice at the time. Having borne the brunt of much heterosexism and homophobia myself, including from my own kids' teachers, as well as students and colleagues who would raise their eyebrows and accuse me and others like me of pushing our own barrow too frequently in discussions of hidden, unintended and exclusionary curriculum. I knew that I was going to have to be less strident and more strategic if I was going to be able to lead through research towards change. I understood the early childhood teacher's role in empowering the child. I also understood that most students I worked with and most teachers in the field were very committed to this idea of uplifting and growing the mana of the tamaiti in a context of partnership with their whānau. If I could document the ways in which heterosexual sexuality was being imposed and institutionalised within everyday thinking and practice to the extent that alternatives to this were rendered other, absent, immoral, wrong, then I could ask a question of fairness about this. In whose interests did that work? And if I could do that, it might be possible to garner momentum for change. So at about this time, I met Margaret Carr and Sue Middleton, who at the University of Waikato agreed to supervise my doctoral study into heteronormative discourse and practice. It was a formidable combination and it provided much scope for wide-ranging, critical and complex thinking and discussions around the work and beyond. Now that study asked, is and if so, how is heteronormativity shaping teachers' practice? In a nod to the, to the socio-historical socio political context of campaigns for civil unions, marriage equality, and the care of children's legislation that was pretty much concurrent with the fieldwork of this study, I didn't pick a great time to do it, but there you go. I dedicated this research to those we have yet to recognise. This was a remark on the fact that even if in education we failed to name, to not include, to not notice and not reflect or engage with certain people who mattered to children, that those people still mattered to children and I expected that this could and would change. In fact, when you read this discursively, that is the work of the yet in this dedication. We've already seen in that mums, dads, kids and cars data that children's understanding of the world and different possibilities for it can sometimes exceed those of the people around them. And although we don't know for sure whether Kurt's suggested two dads family was reflective of a family type that I hoped it might be, it's possible. Especially when Kayako design learning environments in ways that truly share power with the child, that privileges the child's sense making and stays open to the diversity and creativity of what children know and can do. Anyway, this study shone light on how historically rooted ideas of gender, sexuality and the family, all very important concepts to children, you understand, how these concepts were driving certain anxieties, certain thinking, certain ways of practising, and ideas about what was normal or not, 
what was to be worrisome or not, what was appropriate or not to include in early childhood curriculum. Structures of binary gender, of normal early childhood sexuality development and the nuclear family were repeatedly upheld as moral, as legal and as healthy in what people said and did. And in each of those trajectories in their own right, concepts overlapped, they reified each other and they were strongly rooted in the workings of heteronormative discourse, which all the while quietly, um, quietly and persistently repeated the statement, heterosexual sexuality is or as normal. Understanding that this occurred and how this occurred freed us up to recognise and resist the impositions of the heteronorm on everybody. Because to posit the world in a heteronormative way was to raise questions of equity, of inclusion and of injustice for everybody. And when Kayako could draw licence to question that, using te whāraki as a tool to do so, they could connect more readily with different points of view, children and families' different experiences, and open up different possibilities for learning. And I just want to give you a brief example. Marion had been talking about a teacher in the centre that she worked at, and she said another teacher, another lesbian teacher at the centre, had made this story, the mama bears. She'd made it with two mama bears. Well, actually, there's about 10 bears. You can chop and change and choose, whatever you like. But a teacher came to me the other day and she said she was reading the story or telling it outside and she was choosing two mama bears. And one kid said, how can there be two mama bears? And this other boy piped up and said, well, it could be a papa bear dressed up in woman's clothing. And the teacher said, oh yeah, well, that could be it too. There is so much going on in this exchange. There's a genuine attempt on the part of the kayako to represent family beyond the traditional nuclear family structure. There is resistance to this idea or a puzzling over this idea by someone who's listening to this. Two mamas? How on earth does that work? There's an offer by someone else to reconstitute the family as properly nuclear, mum and dad, but with a dad who dresses in a particular way. <laughs> and there's a teacher who stops short of, ass of asserting the family as lesbian-led in this instance, but goes to recognise the suggestion made of the questioning child's peer as legitimate before moving on. Now such interactions matter. Being able to listen out for the everyday ways we privilege certain forms of knowledge and understandings while, including, while excluding others is an important aspect of the early childhood teacher's work. This is because, as I said earlier, most teaching and learning occurs in the interactions between people and things in a place. And for the teacher, after the placement of people and things in the environment and the scheduling of times and routines, their voice is the most powerful teaching tool that they have. So we must remain ever aware of how it's used, for what ends, and why. And so I want to spend a few moments next before I wind up talking about teachers' use of voice and how through narrative assessment practices, early childhood teachers can shape the stories we hear and tell of the powerful child learner in early childhood education. Now, this piece of assessment documentation is from a local early childhood setting who did some work with me in 2013 as I prepared an address around narrative assessment as a tool for community building. The photos and stories here were used with permissions and I uh, committed then to taking steps to protect the anonymity of people and place in any presentations or papers or for teaching purposes where I use the material, hence the obscured faces here. But assessment practice has been a major early childhood research interest for me. And the influence and wisdom of Margaret Carr, of Wendy Lee, Leslie Ramika, and many other friends cannot be understated here. 
I think assessment is where the rubber hits the proverbial road in terms of public accountability for a teacher's decision making and action taken in the name of teaching and learning. Narrative assessment in the form of learning stories lasts. It transfers with children to other places. Your child's next teacher can be greatly influenced by what they read in children's assessment portfolios. These can orient them to children's strengths, their passions and their interests. When that assessment is done well, it can and should directly inform teaching and learning. And in the narrative form, assessment information helps author and authorise subjects of a certain kind, opening up people's eyes to the wonders of what children know and can do, individually and collectively, and to what Kayakul contribute to this. So I want to quote uh, a little bit here from a report to Farno and Kayako that I made from the work that I did in 2013 with them. I said, narrative assessments act as cultural tools that support children and family members to construct personal memories and contribute to identity development. In the example here, the teacher writes that they deliberately placed these two infants together to see what these two would think of each other. The documentation shows the children looking and touching each other, negotiating space, finding new friends in the mirror. The story goes on to give an account of these children as active meaning makers who are jointly engaged with each other in the context of a deliberate teaching activity. The assessment shows learning in community but also special connections with human and more than human others that support the learning of the individuals in that social space. A baby blanket, the floor, a mirror, the play of light and reflection. But there are other stories that this story is telling too. We can see what the Kayako has done here. First and foremost with Nga Pepe, they understand that these two would likely be very, very interested in each other, that they might take encouragement from each other to help them roll over, that they might take pleasure in gazing intently at themselves and each other in the mirror. But more than this is going on. The Kaiko has documented this experience, this relationship, so that these pepe can later revisit this experience, so that other kaiako in the early childhood service can understand and support this relationship, so that the family of these pepe can appreciate the widening circle of relationships that their tamariki are entering into in their absence. Fundamentally, this piece of assessment information changes how we understand these pepe as interactants, as capable, interested people, learning in, with, and from the world and each other. And here's a second example, it's about Max and his working theories about how best to retrieve a wayward carrot that had grown in that space just between the garden planter and the, and the back fence. You've always seen it. This collection of uh, learning stories came from an early childhood setting in Ōtautahi from a project there where teachers and I were working on raising our gaze from individual experiences to thinking about working theories over the more longer term and the learning dispositions and capabilities that were of value. Now I won't deny there is a lot to value in each of these pieces of documentation themselves but for those of you who work in assessment with me now You'll likely recognise I'd have a few comments to make about other aspects of the documentation, like length, like audience, so on and so forth. But really what I wanted to talk about is how this Kayako's account, how their voice opens up so much to be learned about Max, his strengths, his capabilities and his learning dispositions. So the Kayako and the children had been gardening some unharvested carrots were noticed, attempts were made to get them. One had grown in that difficult place, the group was thwarted. The teacher asked the children to plan a different way to try and get that pesky carrot. 
A few days later, Max and the Kayakal returned to the problem and they met with success. And so in the documentation, the teacher has written lots of Max's ideas, his actions. But they have also documented Max's courage and curiosity to work on this problem. They've documented the fact that Max trusted that his views would be taken seriously. His tenacity, his confidence to express his ideas in different ways, the responsibility that Max felt to tackle and solve this problem of the wayward carrot. These are the dispositions that Te Whariki associates with successful learning. And this is what the, the teacher is telling us about. And why does this matter? Because this assessment information, and more like it, <clears throat> is accounting for Max as a capable and confident learner and communicator. Somebody who is important enough in this setting for their teacher and others to take them and their ideas seriously, to write about them, so others can understand this of Max too. And so that Max, in later conversations with Kaiko, with peers, with family members, can be reminded of this himself. And here's the real power, I think. The thing that makes practices like this about equity and empowerment overall. In another instance of theory into life, Jerome Brunner, another scholar whose ideas have influenced me greatly, told us we live our lives through story. We organise our experience, our memory for, of human happenings, mainly in the form of narrative. Stories, excuses, myths, reasons for doing and not doing, and so on. And so for Max to be able to read with others about himself as a learner, who is able to shape the world and accomplish much with others time after time, well, Max might start to believe it. And from those beliefs, fueled by the stories that we are telling, draw strength for the forthcoming challenges that he is undoubtedly going to face as a learner in the world. And so I return to the start, to my assertion that equity and empowerment stand as foundational motivations for the work of the early childhood kayako. Recognising tamariki and their uniqueness as successful learners with mana, making the world alongside us, in community and through the everyday. And I return also to the people who make this happen, and there are a lot of you here. The kayako who turn up every morning to a thousand ideas, to a thousand worries, to a thousand conflicts and other happenings as they do life with tamariki, mokopuna and Fano, using their voice to author and authorise them as subjects of a particular kind. And I thank you. And so as I come to the end of what I wanted to say, I want to take just a wee few moments to comment on what I have deliberately not talked about. I have not raised the possibility here tonight that early childhood education is the preparation of children for so-called real learning at school. Nor have I talked about early childhood education as a support for the nation's labour workforce. I haven't talked about early childhood education as a business opportunity. And I haven't engaged in that investment mentality of early childhood education at all, including as a protective measure for future so-called life course gain. To have done this would have to detracted from the child, the whanau, and kayako, and their very close work fashioning each other in the here and now, where there's plenty of work for us to go on doing, delivering on the promise of te whariki, which is empowering the children to learn. Ko te whakamana, e te mokupuna, ki te ako. Nā everyone. Thank you for showing up. <laughs> Tēnā koutou katoa.
Ko Jessica Palmer Aho, uh, ko te Manukura o te Kiti Aranui, and it's a great pleasure um, that I get to have the last word, and that last word is to offer a vote of thanks, and I think appropriately a vote of huge confidence in Professor um, Alex Gunn. So to do that, um, traditionally, we comment a wee bit on the lecture that's just been presented, so bear with me as I do that. Um, Professor Gunn has acted as a superb tour guide this evening for us, taking us through the progress of her research and the interest that she has had over her career. She's demonstrated a variety of research methods in so doing, and has communicated it all very clearly and engaged us the whole way through. And particularly for me personally, seeing some of those uh, learning assessment stories that popped up towards the end reminded me again of the incredible education that my four um, Tamaite received uh, from wonderfully talented E.C. Kayako here in Dunedin. And the joy at reading those um, to see what they've been getting up to, um, but also to learn several parenting techniques along the way <laughs> from those who were more experienced than me. <laughs> um, and I thought just worth you know, letting you know that um, so my four children are beyond that now, the youngest one is nine, um, but we have kept those books and they're piles of them and they sit in each of our children's what we call memory boxes uh, and the lovely thing is each of them, the eldest is 15 now, um, at times will go down to the storage room and pull them out and read them and so they really do have meaning beyond just the moment and time in which they were uh, recorded. In addition to a masterful demonstration of technique, Alex also steered us towards the values and very human concerns that have underlined her work. That children need to be empowered to learn and that such empowerment recognises and bestows on them mana. That knowledge and curriculum can play a vital role in facilitating inclusion, diversity and equity and so achieves social justice and that leading through research toward change is an incredibly effective thing to do. She also reminded us of the serendipity of timing in life and in work, and that has contributed to her work, that she was in the right place to learn from a community of scholars, and that she was there at the right time, as her field of early childhood education grew very quickly, and a curriculum framework and a qualified profession emerged, which gave her much to focus on. Earlier in the lecture, Professor Gunn told us that Kayako hold immense power and that to wield it well takes, she said, critical thinking, sensitivity, a social conscience, awareness, empathy, the capacity to write, to think, to analyse and predict. I think it's clear from listening to her tonight that her work has demonstrated and embodied those values, hugely so. For me, Professor Gunn's research encapsulates the strength of a humanities scholar at work. She has been open to being moved by the circumstances and the context around her. She has used her skill and ability to address questions of human importance and development. And she has been driven ultimately by values, values of dignity and equality. She's making a significant contribution to our society, and I hope generally having a wonderful time doing it. Professor Gunn has shown us that the teacher has much to give to the development of our little ones, and not for the sake of all those things at the end of her talk, but for the sake of just being them, and how wonderful is that, and that helping them to do that well is of lasting value for all of us. So thank you, Alex, for giving us this opportunity to peek into your work and into your world. I have the great pleasure of presenting to you this gift as a sign of our immense appreciation for this evening, but also for your years of work and service at Otago. Ka mihi nui mō tā mahi, mō tā um, whai kōrero tēnei pō, um, me whakamihi ahurangi Alex Gunn. Tēnā koe.